You've only one life to live. So I be done and let's let the sun in. And gloom can jump in the river. No use to beat on the doldrums. Let's be imaginative. Each day is numbered. No good when slumbered. With only one life to live. Why let the goblins upset you? One smile and see how they run. What does worrying net you? Nothing. The thing is to have fun. All this may sound kind of hackneyed, but it's the best I can give. Soon comes December, so please remember. You've only one life to live. Out, a door relocation is going to generate a whole lot of neighborhood interest. I've yeah. had no one call right, or right. come by. Right, right, no. And, and, and Jill has talked to the neighbors. So. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susan Reardon. I'm the staff hearing officer, and I call the meeting of Wednesday, December 16th to order. Today we have four items on our agenda. However, the last item, which is 19. 24 Emerson Avenue has been continued to January for re-noticing. I'm not aware of any other changes, right? There are not. Under announcements and appeals, um, we have no appeals. I do have one announcement that um, the appeal period for all the projects today is going to be extended to January 7th due to our city offices being closed for the two weeks. So that will give a couple additional days for people to come in and talk to staff if they have issues on the project. And there's no other... Announcements. I announce will be closed. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the staff hearing officer on items not on our agenda today? Let's see. No one. We'll move to the first item, which is 2405 Kai Lenaris. If the applicant would like to come up. Good morning. Good morning. Ready? Yeah. Project site. Um, which is about 10,000 square feet and zoned E1 residential. It's located along Kai Linares. So the property lines, the pink identifies the footprint of the existing residence. Currently developed with a single family residence of just under 1,500 square feet 
and a two-car garage accessed here with a door on the side. The proposed project involves a remodel of the existing structure, um, 345 square feet of additions, little laundry room pop out here on the garage. The discretionary application required for the project is a modification. Although the additions to the residence and the garage have all been designed to conform with the current setbacks of 10 and 30, relocation of the garage door to the front is within the 30-foot front yard setback and requires a modification approval to make alterations to a non-conforming building. Installing the driveway here will allow the applicants to remove the large amount of paving that currently provides access to the garage. They're going to fence, creating an, an entry courtyard for the residents, which will provide additional outdoor living space. The new garage door will still allow a 20-foot setback off of the front lot line, which is our standard. Just in case visiting guests or temporary parking results in parking in the driveway, it will not project out over the public right-of-way. Staff sees this improvement as an appropriate improvement, does not create safety issues for the community, does not add new floor area into any required yard, nor intensify the use of the garage as a garage, and is asking for support of this project as it's submitted. Great, thank you. Would you like to state your name for the record and add any additional comments? Yes, my name is Don Swan, agent for the Hep Petersons. And, and I'm Jill Peterson, I'm one of the owners. Okay. Um, I have brought with me a, a revised plan to because in my conversations that the, draw, the plan was drawn without the, uh, with the within the setback and uh, has been revised to show the 30 foot setback okay. on that. So just for, for your record, and that the fence uh, in, adjacent to the driveway is 30, 42 inches high maximum, so, and as noted on the new plan. Uh, basically, Roxanne uh, described it uh, just the way we wanted it. And, Mm -hmm. And uh, Jill, maybe you have a comment about your the open space that you. Yeah, doing. yeah. Just our hope that if <clears throat> by removing the driveway here that we could have this courtyard because in the winter time, in fact, last night the sunset out this way is just amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so we're hoping to be able to sit out here and maybe put a fire pit in or something and, and enjoy that. Yeah, the on grade patio is allowed as long as it's not greater than 10 inches above grade mm -hmm. it wouldn't be considered an instruction in your front yard okay. um, you're the if you would do to do a, um, a fire pit or whatever you know those self-contained things yeah. it would have to be outside of your setbacks okay um, okay yeah. sure. but we don't in terms of um, zoning a non-grade patio or paving uh, when it's not configured to look like parking it, it can occur up to your property line as long as it's less than 10 inches above grade. Right, right. No, it's right on grade. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. And I'd like to open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 2105 Kai Lanaris? I would like to note for record, we, or for the record, that we received a letter from Ms. Paula Westbury um, just expressing concerns in general. And I'll close the public hearing. Um, I went out to the site and looked around the neighborhood and... Um, as you said in your, le your letter, it is uh, consistent with the development pattern in the neighborhood. There's a lot of garage doors facing the street. Um, and as Ms. Malaza pointed out, the concern arises is when the um, garage is closer than 20 feet um, to the front property line. Um, although the zoning ordinance doesn't allow parking in the garage or in the driveway, that happens quite typically. Someone comes up, drops off something at your house. If they visit, they just stop in the driveway. And if it's shorter than 20 feet, it tends to hang over the the sidewalk, so um, there is adequate distance between your existing house and the, um, the sidewalk to accommodate a car temporarily there. Um, so I find this project, uh, the switching of the garage door, it's an appropriate improvement, and I can make the findings outlined in the staff report and approve your project. Um, and staff's not proposing any conditions. And like I did the general announcement, we are extending the um, appeal period a couple days to January 7th just to recognize the fact we're going to be closed for the next two weeks. And if an interested party wanted to come and discuss staff, or even if you had concerns with my action and wanted to discuss um, it with staff, there's a couple extra days to be able to do that instead of having to do it in the next two days and make a decision. Okay? Very good. Thank you. And also the staff, uh, Planning Commission has oversight of all, my th all of my actions. And if they think this warrants additional discussion before them, um, they can call it up. But a, a garage door change 
um, I don't see how that would um, cause a community-wide issue. Very good. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Sure. So thank uh -huh. you. Here's a clean set for you with those dimensions. Oh, Take this one back and thank you. Okay, the next item is 1308 Dover Hill Road, if the applicant would like to come up to the table. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if you received this is from Paula Westbury was received right before the hearing. Anytime you're ready, Jaime. Can I use mine? Yes. I just have here. Okay. Good morning. Hi, good morning. I'm going to um, give the staff hearing officer a brief uh, description of the zoning modifications that are requested, and then we'll, you'll be allowed to make a presentation. My name is Jaime Limon. I'm this, a senior planner on this project. Um, I did assign this project specifically because um, during construction there were some um, changing conditions that resulted in uh, a reconstruction of a wall that um, it, we attempted to, do, to field uh, revise in the field, and that's how I got involved uh, from a design review perspective. That ultimately um, we decided, uh, working with the uh, applicant, that the best course was to proceed with obtaining a zoning modification because of the slope conditions. And what we have here is. Um, a wall within the interior yard setback along the eastern property line that had to be reconstructed because it was did not meet current code, uh, did not have the required foundation, and um, it was decided in the field that the best course of action working with the engineer was to rebuild it. And uh, because the uh, court was being modified in this area, uh, the height of the walls would be um, increasing such that uh, the eight-foot height maximum would be um, uh, mo required a modification. And uh, at one point, there was discussions about stepping the wall to try to avoid the modification. That's actually how a permit was issued to begin some of the work. The original proposal was to uh, angle the wall down, thus avoiding the eight-foot height um, maximum. Uh, but during construction, obviously, there was concerns about how the appearance of this wall would not match the, the rest of the wall. And just for your information, the Single Family Design Board, board did, in fact, approve the project uh, with these um, taller height walls. They, they recognized that these walls were of a specific height. Um, I think the maximum about 16 feet. Is it about the the <coughs> maximum exposed height is, I think, 13.5. To the, the column, the and 11.5 without the columns and then the railing. Right. So we have a guardrail also that calls, adds to the height. But uh, I believe the board uh, helped mitigate that uh, with the installation of this landscaping and trees uh, to try to soften the impact of the height of the wall. And as you turn the corner, obviously, there's a need also to maintain that height if you, if you have a consistent wall height. So um, along those lines, we had some discussions in the field about trying to soften that corner and that's something that um, we still have to consider as far as getting a final design review after your action. Uh, whether it becomes an administrative approval or consent, it really depends on the outcome of the, the zoning modification uh, hearing. Uh, in, um, in addition, uh, while we were out there considering how to regrade the site and finding solutions on, on the wall, uh, it was um, determined that the original wall that was to be demolished and uh, reconstructed along the driveway within the first 20 feet of the driveway might appear to be uh, rebuilt uh, to a non-conforming height once again, which would be over 42 inches. And I suggested to the applicant that they go ahead and pursue that to make sure they don't have a problem uh, in reconstructing the wall, if, if at all possible. Um, to try to maintain that existing height as, as was originally proposed. 
Um, and I know on the far side visit, you had some concerns about the columns, and, and we'd like to hear from the applicant today about the exact heights of these walls and, and what, the, what the actual final plan is. That concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. Would you like to state your name for the record and add any additional comments? Katie, o <coughs> excuse me, Katie O'Reilly Rogers with the office of Katie O'Reilly Rogers and Stacy Isaacson. Isaac. God, where'd that come from? <laughs> project manager on the project. I will start at the beginning or at the at bottom of the driveway because I think that's the easiest area. Um, we are putting a new 42 inch high wall along the, the road. There's an existing 48 inch high wall to the stairs that are being reconstructed. And although we'd rather match that 48 inch height, we didn't want to go through the mod process, although here we are anyway. The owner would like columns at the driveway. The columns, top of column will also be at 42 inches height. And there's a detail of that. Yeah, when I scale the detail, it scales five and a half, is it? Mm -hmm. It um, may be that we used an AutoCAD detail, and is there a dimension on it of 42? Um, I'll show you. That was, that was one of the questions I had, is just okay. what, um, I'm not clear about where and what. Um, the yeah. This one right here. Santa Barbara sandstone columns at driveway entrance yeah. to match existing. So when I scale it, that's per, five. Yeah. So it's, and then it's height per grading plan, and I apologize. That's a detail, that, a stock detail that we should have modified to 42. But on the grading plan, it calls out top of column 42 inches over finished grade. Mm -hmm. He'd like it to be 48 inches, but what was approved, and that was approved as part of the permitted set at 42 inches. Okay. So the next piece and also part of the permitted set was the rebuilding of this wall, which prior to demolition was at about 48 plus or minus inches, 48, maybe 52, 54. And the wall had to be taken out because there basically is no footing. There's a little concrete trench and then stone that's just stacked on top of it with no steel. The transportation had looked at that because it was over height within 20 feet and because of the fact that the slope is coming to the top and you cannot see this direction if there was no wall you would see no more than if it was an overheight wall they felt it was okay at that time and as Jaime said we're pretty sure we can build it 42 inches and have a little steeper slope but it might be more convenient in the field to build it to 46 or 48 so Jaime said why don't you just throw it in as a mod and if you need the extra height you're not in trouble so that's what that little part has to do with. Okay, I'd, I'd like to sp specify what it is and not just give a, a mod for wall heights because I wouldn't want to see a real tall wall there. Um, I, it would be a maximum 48 inches. Maximum, so that's your idea of maximum 48. All right. From driveway, not from top of grade because top of grade would be plus three inches. <laughs> So then we come up here, this is all underway as we speak, and as Jaime said, there was an existing wall within the setback, and um, as this wall was being constructed, the engineer looked at this and said, it's the same problem as this, there's no footings, it's not going to support the weight of the motor cord, and it's going to go, so let's rebuild it. And as they started rebuilding it, we got to a point where we realized this is going to be over eight feet, and with Jaime's help, we we designed something that came back and notched such that this would step down and stay at eight feet but um, it really we did that knowing that we were going to apply for the mod and that was a uh, a temporary solution that would work but it's not aesthetically as nice so the part when we got out in the field this column and about a 10 foot section of wall will be over eight foot height and I have exhibits that Stacy prepared showing how it will look after it's landscaped Yeah, and I have questions on those two. Um, there are these ones here? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Okay. Yes, yeah, so them too. So right. this is a photograph, a current photograph, standing at this neighbor's driveway looking at this wall section. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like today. There is the wall height per permitted set along here at mm -hmm. the location of the former wall. This is where we notched it down mm -hmm. for the current permitted site. We would like it to come along and match there, which will match the height of this wall mm -hmm. around the corner. And we would like to build a column to match the one on the other side at that point. 
So that's what it looks like right now. That is a sketch of what it will look like with the stone cap coming across. Here's the top of the wall right here. Right here, that's the top of the wall. They, um, as sometimes happens, contractors don't read numbers very well. They poured that a foot high and they're cutting that foot off. Oh, that's not said anymore. We found that out yesterday. <laughs> so this where the stone cap shows, that's the top of wall per the mod set, and it's the top of wall per the permitted set. And the reason we had to draw it was because of that little oops. And this would be the height of the column per the mod set, which matches the column on the other side that you will see. So that is immediately upon construction. This is after one year, and we're putting 15-gallon oleanders in, as approved by single-family design review. And we're also going to add creeping fig on the wall. The front wall is stone. The side wall, we had approved at um, design review to be stucco with a stone cap. It's a lot of money to bury all that stone. And these are the five-year-old oleanders. So in five years, we believe you're, you're not going to see anything. You're going to see basically what you see here, only continuous shrub mass of one item. So on this picture here, this is going to be the wall height. That yeah. right there right is the wall height, correct. And there were plenty of mea culpas yesterday. Well, we thought it would look better. <laughs> Guess what? May I ask a question? Yeah. Is this height uh, incorporating the guardrail requirement? Or um, is there is no guardrail requirement on this side. We're not proposing a guardrail because we have more than five feet of planter area between a walkable surface and the wall. Okay, could you clarify that? Because we had some questions about where you show that, that buffer. Cause, yeah, because your letter, your letter talks about the purpose for um, expanding this area is for parking up here, and parking's not allowed in the setback. And here it says existing motor court paving to be expanded, and it's pointing. This is what was here before, and what's going to happen in this area? Because it looks that's all planted, and there should be a planting sheet in there. It's, I think that note refers to the fact that it's expanded from what it currently is. It currently comes about here mm -hmm. and over. And in order to have better backup and parking space up here. But the dash line here is the limit of the paved motor court. So there is no paving in the setback. There's no parking in the setback. There might be bumper over here, but that's all. I think we have oh, some yeah, I take it back. Yeah, we have some paved it's some off with some plans. We certainly do. We will be happy to foreshorten that as per this plan. Mm -hmm. So that the can I borrow your plan? So that the edge of paving is right there. You probably wouldn't be parking right there, you probably have a bumper overhang whether it's paved or uh, planted. But in any case we'll show the planting coming all the way to here. The planting is um, cap mint with a couple of Metro Sideros trees there. And then along here, per the permitted set, is the 15-gallon only under, which we don't show here. It's part of that set. Ms. Reardon, if it would be helpful, you could look at the mm -hmm. permitted set currently now that shows it more clearly. Mm -hmm. Do you have it? Yeah. Do you have, that, you have the archives, too? Yeah. On the camera. That's what we have. Yeah, the permitted set shows no paving in that setback area, and that is our intent. At your request, I did an overlay just to verify the original uh, auto court area and. The pink demonstrates the original, so there is some additional uh, increase in, in the paved area towards the front of the property, and it is being pulled back a little bit based on, um, we thought that based on your current plan that you're actually mm -hmm. moving it out. So that's well, it looks we like that in this that one right. sheet, but no, the intent is to leave it at the edge of this 
existing wall here to start the paving at that point. Okay. And so in terms of this, okay, so this is new in the setback. Yes. And then, and then it would be this line now that, that we're actually following, which is that line. Okay. That, no. Yeah, there, there's no intent to change this motor court from the permitted set. The only, the only difference really should be this wall, that the permitted set wall came here and over, which uh -huh. required a guardrail there because you could walk right. up to it. Uh -huh. And what we would like to do is not put this L wall in and just continue it straight. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks for coming. I can go back to these photo sims if you want. Okay, yeah. So that, I think, was the most critical angle for you. This is what the um, wall looks like currently. This is where we'd like to bring this column up to match this side here. And there's the top of wall that we would like to bring up to match that height. This reminds just. Um, just as a point, that is not finished grade. That's where the grade's been removed to uh -huh. put the foundation in. Here is a sketch that shows where the new finished grade is. You can see that line, and that's per the permitted set. These are the tree wells, the stone tree wells, and here's the permitted wall along the driveway. And this side does show a guardrail. These, we're going to be putting the olive trees in as field-grown trees, and we'll go out to Eddie Langhorn's yard and, and tag them and bring them. But this is an actual photograph of one of the trees we'll be using. So this isn't five years, 15 years from now. This is what it should look like when it goes in. And the ground cover is all rosemary, which will tumble over the walls and perhaps even the, the tree wells. And you can't see it in this image, but you will in the next. There's a row of the little petite salmon oleander at the bottom of the wall and then the, the olive trees. This is a view from this point in the driveway looking back at this wall. And you can see the footing is here. So it's the same thing. Somehow she removed the uh, scaffolding. I'd like to know how. So here's a drawing of where the, fi the finished grade will be with the buttresses, which currently aren't shown there. And the sketch, of course, is just taking the grades from that permitted set. There's that row of oleander at the base, and here are, again, the field-sized olive trees. This green color represents the rosemary that will come down there. Mm -hmm. So we think from the street and from the client's driveway, you won't ever see that little piece of mod. There's the new column sketched in there, of course. And from this point on the neighbor's driveway, which happens to be a straight shot down the driveway to the street, so this would be the same public view from that street, only lower down. Once it's planted out, even before, even, there's one year, as we said, and then in five years it will be invisible. Now, Jaime, this portion of the um Sorry. That's fine. This portion of the wall here, it it needs ABR still revised or admin for this portion or what? It, the the uh -huh. revision uh, to the plan would require either an administrative approval or a consent review calendar. You mm -hmm. can condition it at, at the either level if you'd like. It will require some additional uh, concern a review, and the, the concern again would be equal to the front. Is, mm -hmm. is does this uh, have the adequate landscaping, or um, is there anything else we can do to soften that appearance? That would be the issue. I do believe, though, when we went before single family design review, they reviewed the wall at this height mm -hmm. with the landscaping that we're currently proposing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because at that point we didn't realize it needed a mod and building department permitted it not realizing it. I think it wasn't until we got out in the field someone said, oh, wait a minute, that looks a little taller than eight feet there. Right, so they have seen it as we're proposing. We're happy to go back and show that to them again, especially with the growth studies. Well, did I read somewhere there was a second wall that was going to be removed if this was approved? Mm -hmm. That, that would be, yes, what's permitted 
is this second wall back uh, here. It has not been poured, although the steel is stubbed out for it and the footing is in. May, may I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, that's right. One of the, the potential solutions was to step the wall and have a shorter wall here and up to a taller wall mm -hmm. to allow the overall height uh, to not exceed eight feet if this wall were five feet away. But in the field, we discovered that the measurement was to the interior face, to the interior face rather mm -hmm. than the, you know, the way we thought you could have the distance. So in any event, there would still be a need for a modification because of the distance. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could revert back and put the wall back here, but from a design standpoint, it could look odd in this corner to have a little step down. Well, what about a second wall along here to kind of soften, provide a step view from this angle here, another lower wall? Well, we we could do that, although the um, distance to the property line is really deceiving, and I'd rather use the entire area. There's only about four or five feet to plant bigger shrub material. If I put a wall in there, I'm going to eat up a foot's distance of dirt, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have a little two-foot planter and maybe a foot on the outside. I won't be able to get the big shrubs in, and they won't grow to that size because they don't have enough soil to support them. That, that was also the suggestion maybe on the field we had talked about trying to step it along the side. Mm -hmm. that obviously, when you introduce mm -hmm. uh, footings and, and retaining walls again, it does limit you, what you can plant, mm -hmm. and that's what the concern the landscape architect had as far as introducing some more steps conditions. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, we had talked about, well, instead of this wall, what if we add a wall out here? It just started looking like it wasn't designed and that it was just patchwork trying to fix a problem. So I'd rather do something that, that looks like it could have been designed in the 20s when all these tall walls were being built in Riviera and that it's consistent with what design review saw and approved instead of coming back and saying, oops, now we're going to add a wall and change this and we can't plant the plants because there's no room. And it is, it's eight feet to this point anyhow, so it's really just that little corner. And the maximum height on that corner is... Well, let's, let's look at the grading plan. The maximum height of the wall, I believe, is oh, that's this is a grading plan. Where's the grading plan? These are all. I think those are the engineers. Okay. Plans. First, these are all structural. Put it on here. Do you have the spots all there? It should be. So these top of columns at 22 were at 110.4. This one was a little higher, 112.25, and we'd like that one to be 107.5. Oh, that's the pre-mod number? The top of column should be about 115.5, right there. So, I'm, I apologize, these numbers are the permitted Lower step numbers version. with the, the stepped walls. So that column would be one fifteen. they're rubbing your mic. So the column... Oh, she is. Sorry. I believe that um, to match this, this column is 13 and a half feet out of grade, uh -huh. so that would be basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we can change the soil at, right at the wall to make sure that's 13 and a half, then the wall would then be 11 and a half out of grade at the, to at the highest point right here. 11 and a half? And it's up here, it's it's eight at this point where the mod starts, mm -hmm. and then as it gets back here, it grows down to maybe four or five feet as the soil, as that hill slopes back up. Okay. All right, um, those are my questions right now. I'll open the public hearing. Um, is there anyone here who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 1308 Dover Hill Road? Yes. Okay. Vice Speakership? If you'd like to come up and have a seat here at the table. That's... Uh, W.C. Naylor. Yes, hi. Hi. Hello, Katie. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Katie, my wife. How are you? Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Winford Naylor, but I'm called Peter, and I live in the house immediately below this property. Uh, and we've been there since 81 when it That's was a vacant off. lot. 
the uh, house I think was built in 83 and then was acquired by the applicant you know, maybe three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. So there was one family there. Um, the house itself doesn't appear to have been changed by the applicant. They've redone some windows and things like that. There have never been any problems with the slopes. There's never been any problem with the neighbors. The houses fit in with the neighbors, including ourselves down below. Uh, the applicant was also involved in the property behind this property and put up a huge wall and then a, a wall that was not permitted on Mission Ridge. So we're a little concerned that it's sort of have backhoe, will dig. Um, you can see from this photo the view from Dover Lane, which is on the low side of our property, across our property, to Dover Hill, and you can see the wall um, that is being under construction. The uh, next picture I'm giving you is a photograph from our uh, kitchen window, and again you can see the wall, and behind the house you can see the wall on the property on Mission Ridge, so we're beginning to feel that uh, we have a fortification behind us. The next couple of photographs are from Dover Hill and their excavation along the road, which we don't really understand since that slope has been stable and there's been no wall there. Uh, now there's a discussion of a 42-inch wall, which would not be obnoxious, but I don't see any point to it. The uh, next set of pictures is the slope area below the wall, which is being excavated right now. I don't frankly really understand why this dirt has to be removed, but it is being removed. Uh, and then the last picture shows uh, the corner that we're talking about. It's really hard without too many human beings in the pictures to see the massive scale of that wall. Uh, as was pointed out by Mr. O'Reilly Rogers, the driveway itself is not being changed very much and the parking area is not being changed very much. So it's sort of hard to understand why we need this 16-foot wall. Uh, and it's also, in my understanding, um, landscaping does not compensate for hard surfaces that are being constructed. The landscaping can come and go. So I am really concerned that this changes the nature of the neighborhood. Uh, I have a picture of the, the Sawyer's house next door as well. And between this property and the Sawyer's house is a public access, which used to be quite a pleasant place to walk. But um, even with the olives, it's not going to have the same flavor that it did. Uh, too many pictures, not well enough organized. Must be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. This is from the neighbor's house. And if you, of course, if you look up the driveway, uh, you do see the Sawyer's residence, uh, for example, in that shot. So the houses in the neighborhood are pretty small. Our house is less than 1,600 square feet. It was built in 1926. I like the fact that Mrs. O'Reilly Rogers mentioned the 1920s. We have not modified our house. We have not modified our landscaping. We bought it from the original owner in 1981. Uh, the house on our to the east has not been modified, nor any of the other houses in the neighborhood. So, frankly, uh, if there was to be a modification here, I would say bring that wall down to the appropriate level so that it's uh, uh, even around the corner, if that's what concerns them, but not higher. Uh, I don't think any of these walls need to be higher. Uh, they weren't higher in the past, and, and everything was stable, and uh, the landscaping was perfectly fine. Um, if the property is beginning to look like a fort, and I don't want to live next to a fort, that's why I got out of the military. Uh, do you have any questions of me? Um, not at this time, but I, I would like to clarify what actually they're asking from the staff hearing officer today. Um, there's two review bodies that this project needs to go before. One's the ABR, Architectural Review, or Single Family Design Board, and the other one's um, staff hearing officer. And the modification requests, the walls that I'm looking at, are the ones in question in shaded areas here. Once they're outside of the required setback, the wall height's limited to a building height, so that's 30 feet. It becomes a design issue before the design board and what it looks like. Is it appropriate to have one tall wall or stepping wall? Should it be landscaped? How should it be screened? So in terms of this upper area, I, I hear your concerns regarding this, this tall, large wall in this area. What I have um, 
jurisdiction over and zoning is just this this small portion right here and then in terms of the walls along the driveway there's a requirement for the first 10 feet along the front of the property line it can't be higher than three and a half feet which they're proposing here and then along a driveway for a distance of of 20 feet back this is the 10 foot here they again can only be three and a half feet so they've said in this area there's some walls that are going to be um, what's three inches or um, up to 48 inches is what we would like yeah um, so that's two four, four feet it's so six inches six, higher six than inches higher higher than what's allowed um, so I, I hear your concerns um, and, um, and and I take them in regards to this section here and um, have did you go before the single family design board when it was being reviewed and discussed this the, the um, I came here for a hearing more than okay. a year ago and so that came to a couple of the single yeah, family yeah. design mm -hmm. um, and it w mainly it was our concern with this large wall but mm -hmm. I understand that you're just they're asking for mm -hmm. a modification that that's what you're dealing with but right. I did hear the discussion of the front wall and the first 20 feet and wanting to go to 48 inches there mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see any reason for that this it wasn't there in the past it didn't need to be there in the past of course with the grading that they've done yesterday and today where they're tearing away that whole hillside under the the tall wall it's hard to know how they're going to reconfigure that and then how they might justify requiring some further modifications mm -hmm. um, okay so i think we have rules for a reason right correct great thank you thank you mm -hmm. Can I show you photos of the walls before they yeah, just a minute. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 1308 Dover Hill? No? See no one? We did receive a letter from um, Paula Westbury regarding this project. And um, I'm not quite sure if it's for or against the, um, the project because you can read it two ways it says this wall is already in leave it there so there was a wall there so is it meaning leave the existing wall there don't put a new one in or is it being that it's already leave this in that's yeah that's already there so I'm, not, I'm just going to state for the record I received a letter expressing concerns regarding the project um, and with that I'll close the public hearing um, and if you'd like if you wanted yeah I just want to show you just the before construction I mean before demolition just that there are walls so this is the yeah the existing okay. wall right here and this yeah. one you're telling me it was um, 48 mm -hmm. it was shoulder height on mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and I wish that was five and a half feet but unfortunately I'm a pip squeak mm -hmm. so I'm guessing that's about 48 inches is what it was okay and Peter is right there there was no wall at the driveway mm -hmm. the owner would like this 42 there's no mark request of course Correct. in that part um, to, for continuation and also he did have a problem with soil sloughing into the street down at the bottom okay but that's not what we're here for that's okay. already all permitted and done yes okay well um, I went out to the site the other day with uh, Jaime and it was helpful since he was uh, familiar with the site to explain because there is a lot of work going on right now and um, what wall is part of this project before me which wall isn't so it was, it was nice I did have concerns um, or I do have concerns if these columns are over three and a half feet because I understand the grade with existing grade mm -hmm. and the landscaping does mm -hmm. cause a, um, a visual impact it's hard to tell which is due to the landscaping which is due to the grade um, and, and it's not on your property so you don't have any control over it mm -hmm. however you do have control over what's on yours and that landscaping may change just like the landscaping on this property is changing so um, I would not be in support of having these columns be over three and a half feet high. Um, as the wall transitions up the driveway, I think it's appropriate to have it um, a little higher to respect the grade and 48 inches, um, you know, half a foot above the um, limit, I think is okay in this, in this situation. Um, I, I do have um, concerns regarding this upper wall However, um, because the finding I need to, need to make is that the requested modification allows for improvement that's consistent with the zoning ordinance and um, it's an appropriate improvement. In reading the, the information that was submitted with um, you know, the application materials, 
my reading of it was that the reason why the walls need to be expanded is to provide parking up in this upper level, recognizing the fact there's no parking down on the street. However, parking's not allowed in the interior yard, and that's where this mod and paving's going. Um, and so, you know, having additional discussions with you here at the hearing and clarification that what was shown on the plans is not what's intended um, and that that area is going to be landscaped. Um, the concern regarding allowing parking in um, a setback without the appropriate review process, because you could go through the review process and ask for modification mm -hmm. for that as well. Um, but that's not what was before me, and so just to be allowing that, it, it, in my mind, it makes it that this wall is not an appropriate improvement because it's allowing for a use that's not consistent with the zoning ordinance. Um, so, and, and also, it, it does represent an, ex, an extension of an existing, um, a non-conforming wall. Well, it's not really non-conforming because it meets the eight-foot, huh? So this part's not, it, it just represents an addition to an existing wall. Um, and so the area, and the area that we're talking about is very small. Um, but I continue to have concerns. I, I understand the landscaping here. I guess I just continue to have concerns going out on the site, and it's hard. It's always hard when a project's under construction to look at it and to visualize what's going to be there because you just see what's there. And it's like, oh my! I remember when Ralph's was being built, oh and you drive by. It's like, oh my! And then now it, it looks nice that mm -hmm. it's done. The landscaping's grown and everything. So it, it, you need to go out there and kind of think of what's going to be there when it's done. Um, so I think given the discussions we've had here, the fact that there's not going to be any paving within the setback, um, that this is going to be landscaped, uh, I think I, I can support this additional wall. However, I'd like to give direction to um, the single family design board, whether it's the consent calendar or whether it's staff's administrative approval, to really look at this area um, to soften the effects from the neighboring property. And we've heard testimony today from the neighbor down south with the concerns, or this is south, right? Yeah. Down slope, I guess. <laughs> it's safer. Yeah, down slope. You know, the visual effects of it in that um, I can understand your needs and I understand the neighbor's needs too. So um, in my motion, I'd like to um, give direction to the, or suggestion, is a direction or suggestion to Single Family Design Board to really look at this um, the area with the screening and whether it be additional landscaping or I can understand your concerns regarding the wall, but if that's determined what, how to soften it to the neighbor, um, you know, I think that would be a good solution. You're leaning forward. Did you want to add comments? Uh, no, I, I understand. That right now there's a proposed landscaping plan that was going to mitigate that appearance. Mm -hmm. the, the question I had was more related to did we want to soften that corner or even not approve the extension? So you're saying that it's 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 okay to have that same height to go across the front, which is really what would be the issue. Um, I, th I think so, because I think okay. jump, if, jotting if I down it. just um, add, when we are out in the field and you see the wall, the setback line is not where this shadowed piece is. The setback line actually falls right at the corner of that column. So the entire wall up to the requested overheight column is That's approved. Right. Yeah, you can see it right there. So it's just this column piece that gets higher. It's not any of the wall. We thought there was going to be a notch, but when they laid it out with the surveyor in the field, that point is right here, not right there. So the mod piece really has nothing to do with the front wall. It's that column, well, except for the column. Well, and that, that that's what I'm, I'm suggesting, mm -hmm. that the column is the most problematic to screen mm -hmm. and because it's the highest point. Mm -hmm. And as you can see from, I think you have the side screening. Where was that, that view? So I'm, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. I need to have an understanding of, is it acceptable that's screening as years. proposed? Um, this does not show the olive tree. Mm -mm. There that's, is an olive. That's right here right. in front of it. So you'll have that big mass as well. In front. So I'm inclined to say that's enough screening landscape-wise. 
Mm-hmm. I was more concerned about did we want to introduce other other elements uh, from a grading standpoint and as an alternative. Um, I don't know if I could do anything else here to, to soften the appearance because that, that, that is what the column height is as proposed. The, the alternative was to not have the column or to push it back. And uh, how that would suffer is that the design would not be symmetrical. Yeah, then I think you lose that historic. And then, so that's really what um, I was um, hoping to discuss. Um, um, well, I, um, I agree with you, and I would leave it up to the single family design board to work with the applicant on how to soften that corner. Okay, then I'd prefer to have it just be on the consent calendar and have her work with the landscape architect to, to go come up with that corner. Design. Okay, that's fine. We'll work, yeah, and then um, just to soften it and be um, sympathetic to the, mm -hmm. the neighbor's concerns and um, how to make it not appear as a, a fortress off-site. Because um, also looking at the other photos that were submitted, um, With the neighbor's house here, you know, having these two, and it's not your house. Is, is that the only picture? The neighbor's house here. This here is the How, neighbor to the. Yeah, east. and then having this wall next to it. But yeah, here's mm -hmm. um, just how to soften it a little bit on the corner. Well, I think that the proposed landscaping will do it, and we may want to upsize to 24-inch box the oleander in this area, and those are available bigger, but I'm happy to work on consent and see what solution okay. is there. All right, so then I'd also like to clarify, I don't know if it would be in the project description, or if it would be in the motions, that the, um, the maximum height of the wall, Gloria, along... The modification for the wall is to <laughs> start over. The <laughs> modification for the wall height along the driveway for it not to exceed 48 inches, and then that the column be the three and a half feet. And um, also from reckon dri from driveway grade. Drive yes, driveway yes. Adjacent. Grade. Yeah, driveway grade is fine. And then um, also no, it'd probably be just noted in the. Um, minutes that the actual wall height um, poured or whatever is going to be reduced one foot just to recognize that that's part of the project description that it is changing out there. It will be, I don't know if it's exactly one foot, it will be reduced to the grade of the previously approved permit set which okay. keeps it at a maximum eight feet up to this point. Okay, and then the area of the column, the corner column is going to be 13 and a half feet and the maximum wall height is 11 and a half feet. And we will submit a new sheet that has all those spot elevations on it okay. for Jaime for single family so that that's all on the record. Okay. All right, great. So I approve your project Thank you very um, much. with those revised conditions and findings. And um, I think you were here at the beginning of the meeting when I announced that the appeal period is going to be extended to um, yeah, January, January 7th, 7th okay. given our two-week closure. Okay. And then that also then would extend the um, planning commission's period where they, they have oversight authority of all my actions, and if this raises community-wide issue, they have the ability to pull this up before them. Um, so if either that would happen, Mr. Lamone would get in contact with you. I'll cross my fingers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks very right. much for your time. Sure. And I'll see you on January. Your furlough starts on Monday? Pardon? The two weeks off starts Monday? Yes, week for the city? Okay. Yes, yeah. The next item, which will be the last item today, is 101 West Cannon Perdido. If the applicant would like to call. Oh, yes. oh, I announced at the beginning of the hearing that that item has been continued. I'm sorry. It's been continued until January 13th. It needs to be re noticed. There's an, an additional mod that it needs. Yes, and um, what you can do is call Ms. Malazzo after, the, um, after we come back from the furlough and confirm it's still on. It will be noted on the agenda, and as con if it's not on, it will be noted again on the agenda as being continued.
Yes. Yes, the neighbors will be re-noticed. Do we have an agenda sitting over by the request? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll see. about things that you announced at the beginning. If there would just be a way that you could maybe post those things someplace so we could be looking at them right now and we'll leave. No, sure. It, it is actually listed on the agenda as being continued. But we, we can do that right in note if you're interested in this item. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, anytime you're ready, Kathy. Good morning. This is a application for 101 West Ken and Perdido. I'll give you a brief project description and the applicant will um, give some more details when it's his turn. Here is the project site. It fronts on Chapala Street, De La Guerra Street, De La Vena Street, and actually uh, West Cannon Perdido as well, but it has access um, from Chapala, De La, Vina, uh, De La Vina, and De La Guerra Street. The project is a proposal to divide the 1.73 acre site into two lots, with the new lot line being here, and to convert the existing building located in the corner, which is the Verizon switching facility, uh, convert that building into four commercial condominium units. Proposed lot one over here would be 1.14 acres and would include the uh, existing building and 25 parking spaces. Proposed lot two would be um, here and would include 77 parking spaces. To give you just the brief history of this site, um, back in 2004 to th 2006, we had an application to merge uh, 10 existing lots, which included the subject site plus this lot here, a merger of 10 lots and then a lot line adjustment. And the resulting uh, lots were the current lot and then this one here. Um, when that was completed, this lot was sold uh, by Verizon. So now they are, they retain this configured one lot. Um, what they are intending to do now is to do the lot split and then um, eventually sell, I understand, proposed lot two and keep one of the units in the main building here and uh, sell three condominium units in the future. The project meets all zoning requirements. Uh, with the lot split, um, there is an off-site parking agreement that would be required because, of course, the number of these parking spaces are required for the the existing and um, proposed condominium units. Let's see. Uh, in regard to design review, um, there is a requirement that um, from building safety that they have an accessible path of travel. So um, there is a ADA lift proposed along the Chapala Street frontage and that it did go to HLC and it's in the process of being worked out all the details. Of course they will go back to HLC after um, if they are approved today for the, the final details about how that will look, but that will be along um, Chapala Street. Uh, the project is exempt from further environmental review. Uh, we have a, a few changes to the conditions of approval, and I wanted to go through those with you. A couple of them are just little cleanup items to make things a little more um, understandable. Um, 5B, spaces available available for parking. We just added that they are for proposed lots one and two and that they um, it's been changed to all required parking spaces to be kept open. Um, they have 102 parking spaces and only 90 are required. Although since they are on this map, they would uh, be required to remain unless um, the applicant comes back to, to reduce the number of parking. But we're just clarifying that both lots are um, included in this condition here. 
uh, I've removed one condition from B2. It's been transferred over to another, which I'll talk about later to make that a little more clear. The project subject to the Chapala Street guidelines. So you'll see under B4 that we've made um, a little change. And I've talked to the applicant about this and also Public Works. The way we had this worded before was that the improvements shall be um, consistent with the Chapala Street guidelines, which would include, and the applicant is showing, a new bulb out on the corner of Chapala and Ken Perdido, and also um, but Public Works has come back and suggested this new change where they would be required to do the bulb out and then the halfway across each street to do the brick crosswalks. But as an alternative, instead of doing that, um, perhaps doing two bulb outs and not do the crosswalks. Um, I know the applicant has some concerns about that and Actually, I, I think it's fine to just leave it the way it was um, and that the details of that could be worked out later since it's an HLC concern about how to actually implement the Chapala Street guidelines. Um, staff is fine with just leaving it the way it is. This is just giving a little more um, information about the potential um, result of them, how they're going to implement that. Um, and we can talk about that more if you'd like to. Um, and then just moving on to condition eight, we just um, add a little more information about the number of parking spaces on each lot. Number nine, um, wanted to clarify a little bit about this. Um, there was a left, an open left site on site years ago, and that was closed in 1999, I believe. There is an open SMU site mitigation unit site. Uh, this is not listed on the Cortese list. Um, it's a voluntary cleanup. We've talked to County Fire, and they're in the process of actually closing this. They have a draft deed uh, restriction that's um, being finalized, and um, County Fire is fine with just having that deed restriction recorded before the final map is recorded. Um, and. Uh, we would just request a clearance letter from them that they've fulfilled what they needed to fulfill um, prior to the recordation of the final map. So the, the deed restriction is that they've complied with it? I don't, I haven't read it to know exactly. It's not a, um, well, they're not concerned in, in that there's no residential units being um, required. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're fine with that. I don't have the language of the deed restriction. Maybe the applicant can talk about that a little bit more. Um, we were concerned that if it was on the Cortese list that that would bring up some issues with us, but um, it's on the local list. It's a voluntary um, project having to do with some leaking um, batteries as part of their um, backup And system. you spoke with Melissa Hetrick on this? I spoke with our environment analyst, um, Deborah Andalaro, okay. who she and I spoke with County Fire Department okay. on this site. And um, we're confident that it's not an issue, that we get this deed restriction okay. and clearance from County Fire, and that um, they don't have any concerns about this particular project being conversion of office to condominiums, that there would be any any concerns about that project okay. in regard to this. Uh, but we like, I put in one of our sort of boilerplate conditions that we want to have um, compliance with, make sure they're complying with the county fire requirements and that we make sure we, we have a letter from them, which I could add in there too, prior to recordation to make sure they're meeting all the requirements. Okay. okay. And that's basically it for the revisions. Um, the applicant has requested H to be changed, um, and I didn't get that in there to be changed um, in time. And he'll talk about that. He, he's met with Building and Safety and requested that a change to Condition H read 
that the parcel map shall not be recorded until such time as the conditions in sections A, B, and E are satisfied. This would be instead of um, here where the parcel map shall not be recorded until the C of O for the building permit has been issued. And I didn't insert that in there yet. Um, it would be up to, to you whether you felt like that was appropriate. The way we would make sure that the work is completed is that an agreement would be executed um, with the building safety um, in the city to make sure this is done. And uh, the applicant's ready to discuss this in more detail. Um, representative from building safety couldn't make it to the meeting today, but it's um, my understanding that from building safety standpoint that they are, they're fine with this uh, change to the condition. So with that, um, staff recommends approval of the project subject to the numerous revised conditions of approval. This would be a tentative subdivision map to divide um, the lot into two lots and convert the existing building into four commercial condominium units. <clears throat> okay, so thank you. Where is um, in here? Where is the requirement for the lift in in these revised conditions? I don't believe the lift is called out in the conditions. It is part of the project. It's shown on the project plans. So and how the details of it are to be um, worked out more, but they are part of the project description. I guess it's just included as improvement shown on the um, in the project plans. So then how uh, would this change the timing of the lift? Because if it's in section A, he, it needs Well, it's the way I look at it, it's included in the project plans as requirement to be finalized at HLC to get that design finalized. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I'll so let the applicant building, talk. And any building permit requirements. Okay. And we, of course, could add that specifically if you like. All right. Good morning. Would you like to state your name for the record? And Good morning. Add? My name is Michael Morgan. Uh -huh. I'm uh, from Blue Core Limited. We are the representative for Verizon. Verizon is the owner. Verizon California is the owner and um, beneficiary of this entitlement process. We're just merely processing it on their behalf. Uh, 3961 Blackbird Way, Calabasas, California, 91302. Um, just wanted to acknowledge planning and engineering and building safety's efforts in, in putting this together. We uh, are appreciative of all the work that we've done, and we support the staff report that's been presented to you, as well as the majority of the conditions as revised. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I would like to go through a couple of them with you and perhaps expand on, on our position of some of those conditions, as well as uh, go into further detail regarding our proposed modification of Condition H. Um, Everything else that Kathy mentioned, it, we're in complete uh, concurrence with and look forward to move, moving on with this project. Um, going through the revised conditions of approval, starting with uh, B4, which refers to the Chapala Street guidelines, uh, we uh, are in concurrence with, with Kathy, with staff's opinion that uh, the condition as it was originally drafted uh, was fine and could be left that way um, for a, a couple of reasons. The Chappelle Street guidelines are mentioned as part of the condition. Uh, they are guidelines, not necessarily specific requirements. And throughout this process, we've been working with public works and traffic and uh, the HLC through our preliminary hearing as far as kind of nailing down the, the, the specific requirements for this site as the Chappell Street guidelines apply to this site and our frontage. And I think that specifically identifying any individual improvement 
would not be prudent at this time because we're still going through that phase where we need to take in your uh, direction as far as design is concerned, as well as going back to the HLC for preliminary and final approval where things may change. Perhaps these identified items may be uh, further modified by the HLC, and if that's the case, at that point, we wouldn't be able to comply with the conditions as drafted if they are changed. So uh, I think if we leave it the way it is, it allows us to continue working in the manner in which we have been working. And um, I think the city's concerns are going to be uh, satisfied through the review process as well as through the submittal and review of the street improvement plans that we need to, to, to go through after uh, we obtain all of our approvals and prior to recording the map. The... Um, Fire Department SMU condition that uh, was added B9, as far as the deed restriction is, uh, you had a question about that. I, I do not have specific uh, wording or, or specific uh, copy of, of that deed restriction. What I do know is that the deed restriction is the item that would ultimately satisfy the uh, Fire Department's requirements, that the end of that process is the recording of the deed restriction. So um, once that deed restriction is recorded, we can provide copies to the city. Um, I, I, it here it acknowledges that evidence of full compliance with the requirements be provided, so we can provide a copy of the deed restriction, and as uh, Kathy mentioned, perhaps a letter from the fire department. And uh, Verizon's fully aware of this situation. They've been working with the county fire department on this, and I know that it is getting close to being completed. Okay. So we have no concern about that. Okay. And then moving on to condition H. The way that it is currently worded implies that the map cannot be recorded prior to occupancy being issued on the building. Um, building permit, it says, um, which it, in one case is, is somewhat misleading and, and building and safety agrees with that because it implies that occupancy of the condominium units is granted and that's not the case. The, the lift is, it requires a building permit and closing of that building permit is considered occupancy, but there's nothing to be occupied. So that, that's the first concern over the language of that requirement. And then the second point is that in talking to, to Mr. Hansen of Building and Safety and, and understanding this whole project where this phase of the project is merely the, the subdivision and creation of the legal space, and the next phase would be the improvements, tenant improvements, uh, physical changes to the site, all, all as one project, um, Mr. Hansen would be satisfied with uh, the submittal of all the the plans, construction drawings and plans for the lift, as well as the landscaping that's required for the front of the building, and then uh, possibly enter into a development agreement, much like what Public Works has in place for their street improvement plans, as well as the posting of a surety bond, if that's required as well. Um, and that would satisfy his, his concerns and his conditions to allow this map uh, be recorded, this parcel map in the condo be recorded. So what I propose is that instead of tying the parcel map to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, that it be tied to the satisfaction of the various conditions that would apply prior to obtaining public works permits, building permits, or a certificate of occupancy. Um, the Public Works Department already has a mechanism in place where all of their improvements can be deferred by way of entering into the land development agreement and boasting securities. Uh, the building department would allow the lift and uh, occupancy to, offer, to operate in the same manner. Um, so we feel that by specifically identifying A, B, and E, we include all of the requirements that um, would be necessary in order to obtain permits, but not pull permits and actually physically do the construction until such time as it makes economic sense to do everything at once in the future. Now, as to, to address your question related to where the lift is specifically identified in the conditions, it is not. However, I believe that E1, that uh, the building permit plan requirements that plans show all design, landscape, and tree protection elements as approved by the Historic Landmarks Commission would encompass that because the Historic Landmarks Commission is going to review 
the final design for the lift as well as the landscaping in front of the building, not only in the public right of way but also on the private side of the of the line. Okay, what's triggering the requirement for lift? The condo conversion? The um, yes, the there is current ADA. Uh, I'm sorry, accessible uh, entry in the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. um, and to give a little background, this, the, the way that this building operates is it's a, a switch facility. Mm -hmm. It's got a number of uh, floors of telecommunications equipment. There's no real other use. There's no office use. I mean, there's space in the building, but it's not utilized. And there's no public uh, use of the building because of its secure manner which the switch facility operates. Uh, going through this process and creating the condo uh, conversion invites the... Uh, the presumption that there will be public use of the building and therefore the, the building and safety department would like to see not only the accessible entry in the rear of the building from the parking lot but also from the street because now it's implied that this entrance will actually be used uh, which it currently is not so that that is where that requirement came into play um, so it's really directly related to the use of the space that is being created which would further require tenant improvements and other modifications inside of the building that are not taking place at this time because we're not proposing to occupy the building at this point we are just proposing to create the space but once you record your map you can sell it and they can do what the next owner can occupy it right away right who wants specific tenant improvements are conducted the, the building is not currently in an, an occupiable space so someone can't just go in there and occupy it. They would need to do tenant improvements and uh, comply with various other building right. code issues that are not related to the legal creation of the condominium space. But if it's the creation of the condominiums that is triggering the lift requirement versus the tenant improvements which are long in the future, the, the lift the lift is being triggered right now because of the conversion permit request, not because it's proposed to be occupied separately, right? Right. Okay. And you're asking for that to be deferred until the tenant improvements come are coming forward? Not necessarily, just deferred along with, I mean, the, the, the land development agreement for public works, for example, has a one-year term on it. It just allows flexibility to combine all the various improvement projects in one. If the tenant improvements don't come along within that time frame, we'll still be obligated to perform the, the work in the public works permit as well as the building permit, is the lift and the landscaping. I'm just asking for that opportunity to put everything together and not do piecemeal work. And um, Verizon, once they sell off the units, will no longer be in control of the majority of the building, and they are not in control of the design and, and redevelopment, if you will, of the surplus areas in the building. So if someone does come along and has a different design or a different proposal for how that entrance is going to look and how the lift should work, then they'd essentially be redoing everything that we did. And we'd like to try to avoid that if we can. And um, in talking this over with Mr. Hansen yesterday, Building and Safety, um, he acknowledged that, that that is understandable and that the proposed uh, alternative is acceptable to him. Uh, the the deferment with the understanding that plans will be prepared and submitted per the conditions that are have been drafted versus the actual physical installation of the work that would be uh, proposed on those plans. But does building and safety have the capability for bonding? I know we do it for public improvements before because if they don't do it, we don't go on private property and do it. To actually do the work. It's my understanding that Building Safety has agreed that this would work. I haven't talked to them specifically about what kind of agreement or bonding. I don't have the details on that. The way that Chris said it, it, it would be uh, the same mechanism as the public works, but a separate one, that, so that it's so that the building interest, the building department's interest, is specifically identified by way of a separate agreement and a separate security from the public works interests. But it would operate in the same manner. Okay. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah, we did get rid of. Um, other than that. Um, I'm not sure if you want to look through the rest of the plans or if you've had an opportunity to. I'm simply just showing the layout of the various condominium space in the building and the 
preliminary fashion uh, that would be finalized as part of the final map, and then our landscape plan. Um, actually, we'll show you the elevation first. The Chapala entrance um, is shown here, and the lift would be proposed to be on the south side of that entrance. Uh, a blown up details actually behind us. So the uh, landscape plan shows not only uh, landscaping in conformance with the Chapala Street guidelines, but also the HLC had mentioned that they wanted to see an enhancement to the existing landscape planner areas that are on the private property in front of the building on Chapala and Cam Perdido, so we show that as well. Um, there have been discussions related to the tree installation at the corner um, that is part of the, the Chapala Street guidelines and the concern over the interference of that tree with the existing traffic signal. Our landscape architect has met with uh, individuals from parks and transportation to come to an, ar an arrangement that works and that's what's indicated on these uh, plans as well as in this note that there is an agreement that has been reached and that our final plans will reflect that agreement. Other than that, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Okay. And looking forward to moving on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 101 West Cannon Perdido Street? Okay, we received a letter um, from Ms. Paula Westbury on this project, too. Oh, you know what? I wonder if Jaime walked out with them all. You have it? Okay. Um, expressing, um, or actually she's saying she's a opposition of the condominiums. If, if I may? Don't out something the rise and stuff. Yes. It, it is a little difficult to, to, to read, but I believe that she is referring to converting it to residential, which is not the case, uh, because she does say um, keep the office space zoning right here so, she's seen so I think that she's misunderstanding commercial condos as residential condos okay Thank that's you. my interpretation Thank of the letter you. okay with that I'll close the public hearing um, do you, so I have actually Three sets of revised conditions in the original ones. Did you date them so Gloria knows which one we're talking about? Do you know? The one that we are. You hand wrote yeah. I, this one. Uh huh. That's the most current one? This is the most current. It does not have the change to H. Okay. So I have, I had some questions on the conditions. Um, I went out to the site and. Um, I was happy the back gate was open, so I drove in and, and looked around. Uh, I think um, it makes sense. I understand why Verizon wants to convert it into condominiums. Um, I think it's consistent with the general plan, um, zoning, you know, all that. My concern, initial thought is why split off required parking? Um, and it's at its own separate lot under somebody else's control, and is that really an appropriate um, use. So um, in regards to the conditions, when I look through the conditions, um, you know, I want to understand how, um, for the, the long term, how those conditions are going to, or how those parking spaces are going to be um, protected on that site. And um, so one of the conditions uh, is one of the revised conditions. Um, on page four of eight, where you know it talks about off-street parking, and it was originally it talks about that um, off-site uh, parking can be provided off-site within 500 feet walking distance, and that, and so that's what the condition was, is to have that um, recorded against the property, um, and I and and I want your comments on this too. I thought it'd be good to have um, it specified the number just so we know when someone's later on saying well how many parking spaces was envisioned um, that just it makes it more clear you know for future um, 
research and redevelopment of this property so the owner knows what they're getting into and what kind of what numbers of parking above and beyond what's required for that particularly proposed use that needs to be on site. So that's that condition. But I did notice staff combined two conditions. Um, the dedication one, B2, old B2, mm -hmm. on page 2 of 8, with this new one. And the title has just changed, Off-Street Parking and Reciprocal Access Agreements Required. Um, and it just talks about parking, the second part, where it says a reciprocal access agreement in gross for vehicular and pedestrians for all properties associated with the subdivision. That doesn't need to be lumped in with eight anymore? Well, the reason why I'm, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> took it out of here is this relates to dedications to the city, so that wasn't the appropriate uh -huh. place to put it, so that's why it's not there. Um, the agreement will include access it's because we need to cross over you know, coming onto this site, crossing over to get to here to park, and vice versa, and to just and for include, the circulation. and then yeah, the circulation across mm -hmm. to just here. So we just included it as reciprocal access agreement um, as part of this to make sure this all works correctly between the two two lots. Right, the heading but, says that, but, but I didn't. Yeah, that that will be included in, and we could say also a reciprocal access access yeah. agreement required down below as well. I just don't want to be Maybe redundant. I did just want to give a little more info about the parking, um, but I, to I make sure the access is included. Uh, so it's already on there is what I'd be reading. The, the, primary, the primary objective for reciprocal access um, is the circulation, because there is independent existing access off of Daily Gator that would allow entry, exclusive entry, into Lot 2. However, given the existing configuration of the parking lot, that crossover would be required. So that's why we propose this reciprocal access area uh, over and across lot one in favor of lot two. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the condition goes, I think that uh, first and foremost, your comment related to specifically identifying the number of stalls, I, I think that's completely acceptable and understandable. And I think that's, in fact, the intent of the covenant so that mm -hmm. whoever comes down the line at whenever point in time understands what their obligations are mm -hmm. with the property that they purchase. So that, of course, that's fine. And I think that what we could do if, uh, if it's, uh, it satisfies your concern is we could just add a, a sentence at the end stating that a reciprocal access easement shall be executed, shall be created um, as indicated on the tentative parcel map. I mean, it, it's, well, yeah, it's we already shown the sentence, intent is yeah. there. And there's actually two different options that are available. Either um, it can record as part of the map or it can record as a separate instrument with the map. Mm -hmm. um, so long as reciprocal access is created, I don't believe it really matters which mechanism is used. In some cases, it's beneficial to have it on the map. In other cases, it's beneficial to have it as a separate instrument. Um, so I think that uh, if, if you'd like to add that sentence, uh, we have no problem with that. Yeah. That's clearly our intent. I, I wanted to add, we, we didn't want to just copy this and put that in the condition because I'm looking ahead thinking that someone could um, cross here and park here. I mean, that would be the access to this is one way. It's not just it's people coming in and coming this way, but there's also access to this parking space across this because um, uh, I'm not sure this is going to be monitored at all. Um, someone coming here to park over here. So there's also other reciprocal access agreements I think that would be required, not just this one. So I wanted it to be broad enough that it could be all um, worked out in the agreement. And if and I, I could think, address yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you'll notice on our preliminary condominium yeah. site plan, um, First of all, uh, first and foremost, that that issue that you address with crossing over and the access is is really, a, in my opinion, the obligation of the the private owners and users to enforce. So the condominium association that would eventually be created would have that responsibility to make sure that, much like any other private property, that you know parking uh, people that are using their stalls and parking on their properties are uh, authorized to be on site, and not trespassing and whatnot. Um, but furthermore. Uh, the intent of the condominium shows that these stalls, all of them at this point, perhaps, uh, I don't believe that will change, but it may, um, are limited to Verizon's unit uh, as 
kind of a, a reservation of parking stalls for their use. Uh, it's a matter of security, a matter of their operational requirements, um, because this is a very sensitive use inside of the building, so we needed to take those extra measures instead of just making a, a blanket open property where circulation can go anywhere and anybody can park wherever they want. We needed to kind of tighten it up a little bit for Verizon's interest. So the um, although it's possible at this point in time with the way that the property is currently laid out without the redevelopment of this site, it's clear, free and clear for someone to enter off of lot two and go and park here. Um, it is clearly not the intention of, of Verizon and it'll be written into any purchase and sale agreement or CCNRs that uh, that is simply not allowed as part of a private party enforcement. So that's why we feel that reducing the reciprocal access area to just this portion of the property um, not only not only addresses the need for the circulation but also kind of puts a boundary a legal boundary on where users of this property are allowed to go and it's kind of setting up that um, documentation of where you're allowed to go where you're not allowed to go is just part of the private operation well, the of the easement site. would allow them to travel over you could still make this area assigned to the one unit no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm, but what I'm saying is that the easement would be restricted to this area. So once a car entering off of here that is not supposed to be on lot one, if they travel outside of that easement area, they would be in violation of their right as owner and user of lot two because they're not on the easement that they have been granted. They would, at that point, could be considered trespassing. So. That way, we're further we're, we're further protecting the use of this drive area, which is also there for fire purposes and loading and other Verizon operations. Um, we're protecting the drive area as well as the parking stalls. So but I don't see well staff's proposal that the reciprocal access easement would um, limit your ability to already to restrict that area. Uh, well. If I heard Kathy correctly, the, the recommendation was that the reciprocal access easement covers everything, correct? Well, I, because I didn't know specifically how you wanted to control it, uh, thinking that this probably wouldn't be the only way you would. I, I can just see it working in the future that people would be coming off different and crossing over, even if they're not allowed to, that that's going right. to... Right, and, and that, that, that gets back that to... That will happen. That gets back to, in my opinion, a private party right. matter that would need to be okay. uh, addressed by and between the, the various property owners. So, that, that, and that's what my commentary is really related to, is having a reciprocal access easement but limiting the, the easement area to just this portion for the circulation purposes of Lot 2, not to allow entrance, because presumably it could work the other way. Someone that would be uh, an owner or user right. of Lot 2 can enter through the other entrances over and across Lot 1 to get right. to Lot 2, and that's something that we don't okay. want. So. We feel that this is a reasonable compromise. Okay. The other um, comment was. Um, The copies. I know. <laughs> okay. So, in regards to the Chapala Street public improvements, um, I. I could go either way um, I, in terms of specifying what they are and not specifying what they are. I can see the pros and cons of both of them, leaving it, and, and, and that's why it's good to hear from you as the applicant because the way it was written here it says, as determined by the Public Works Department, the improvements shall include new and or remove and, or remove and replace to city standards the following including improvements outlined in the Chapala Street guidelines. Grind, and it says this, so it's calling out some and then it says including the ones in this guidelines. And so 
you know, makes someone question, well, what is going to be, what are the improvements that are included in these guidelines? You know, is it the, is the sky's the limit or is it, you know, is, is it limited in scope? So in terms of an applicant, um, I'm just wondering if you want it more specific or um, just fine with the, um, wor the wording the way it is. And what I'm hearing from you is that you prefer to have the wording the way it is instead of specifying either the bulb out and two half crosswalks or two bulb outs without the crosswalks. You'd rather just have it the generic way, feel more comfortable in that. Yes, I would. And, and to comment a little further on that, the, the specific items that you mentioned, the grind and the cut, those are all standard conditions right. that may or may not apply to any project. So um, we're not overly concerned with those being specifically identified, but because there is a matter of really discretionary um, implementation of the Chappelle Street guidelines, we feel that it would be best to leave it open. Uh, we have had direct conversations with the Public Works Department about this specific issue, so the request is acknowledged and, and we're working together. I just don't want to be tied up in any way, even if it would perhaps benefit us if, you know, the sky's the limit sort of thing comes into play. Uh, I just think that we've been working well uh, thus far, we should just continue with the path that we're going on. Because it, it is part of my discretion as uh, you're requesting for a tentative subdivision map. So in terms of being consistent with the zoning ordinance and the general plan and the implementing guidelines and that kind of stuff, it is under my review on, on you know, that kind of issue. Because I know in your presentation you were talking about you know, HLC that implements those. They do if it's not a, not a um, discretionary permit that needs review by the Planning Commission or the staff hearing officer. So it, it is it is within my purview as part of the the, um, the findings, mm -hmm. but I don't have concerns with stamping a plan that shows you know the bulb out and the, the sidewalks as you've shown. I, I believe I acknowledged your your uh, authority as well as uh -huh. HLCs. Okay. I, I didn't mean to oh, no, sidestep no. that in oh, any no, way. I was just making it clear oh, that no, you know the guidelines are important and they are part of the discretionary review process and they are taken into account by any review body that reviews projects. Absolutely, and that's why what because with respect to the guidelines, this isn't the final stage. Mm -hmm. We'd like to have your direction, your okay. recommendations. Um, if you feel it would be appropriate to specifically identify uh, certain improvements, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, that is your discretion, obviously. Right. Um, we'd rather have them in the form of, of, of direction and commentary so that we can mm -hmm. kind of incorporate everything in, into the final mm -hmm. design that ultimately would go to the HLC. Okay. So. Um, All right, and then the last one is on page seven of eight. Uh, where it's changed, um, it actually should remain the planning commission there. The because my action, if my action were to be appealed, or if they were to suspend it, um, that's actually the last. Yeah. The oh, last sorry. Yeah, yeah, eight of eight. So I was. Morning. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Gloria, I was looking at the wrong one. Eight of eight, number I, where it says litigation and indemnification agreement. It's in the event if the planning commission's approval of the project's appealed to city council, and then the city um, denies the appeal and approves the project, then the applicant uh, will defend the city. So it, we keep this the planning commission because uh, my action is appealable to the planning commission, mm -hmm. and then right. their action is appealable to city council. My action is not directly appealable to the city council. That's why I didn't change it to start with. Yeah, Sorry no, to bring not really. <laughs> Yeah, so that, okay. that one's okay. That was one of the things yeah. I flagged as saying, hey, is this right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah that's right. That, and that's the reason for that. Okay, so um, like I said, I went out to the site, um, drew the staff report, and um, I, I agree with the project's purpose uh, of, of the condominium conversion for commercial uses. And... Uh, um, like I said, my main concern, you know, it's a built site. You're not proposing any additions. Um, there's some facade upgrades. There's the lift. Um, so the main concern is just with the parking and making sure it is there available for the use. And I think these agreements would um, accomplish that goal. And so I, I make the findings outlined in the staff report. 
And I will comment on the condition, the proposed change conditions. I, I would like the um, reciprocal access agreement wording added into. Um, so I had mine all nicely tagged. <laughs> into the one with the, um, number eight, um, B8, where it says offsite parking and reciprocal access agreement. Um, you know, to include the reciprocal access agreement as we discussed. Um, Are you saying add that sentence that was in the previous? Yeah. Just add another With, sentence to that? Yeah, the reciprocal access between, which would allow, because the purpose is to allow access, well, you need, these people do need to circulate here, but these people need um, the ability to park on this. That's part of the parking covenant. The green, yeah. So, there's, there's two agreements. Yeah, so these the parking people, covenant yes. satisfies the use of this lot or these parking stalls for those. By, these, right. by this. The reciprocal access agreement allows the users of lot two to circulate through lot one. So that the reciprocal access provided for lot one is mm -hmm. part of the parking covenant right. over lot two. So and I, I think, agree, yeah, and I agree with your comment in that any redevelopment in this site, they're going to have to provide their own parking so they don't need access to proposed lot one. Right. And that the, so, but these people need right now the circulation to work for the lot. So Which I is, agree with you. Okay. Yes. In that case, I don't believe it's appropriate to just simply remove and replace the original right. condition yeah. as drafted because it's not quite misleading. I think that it should specifically identify the reciprocal access area that's shown on the tentative map. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I can do that. Add that. And then strike out the addition in, in condition four. Just have it the way it was originally proposed. Thank you. And then with the condition I remaining as a planning commission, so that same. And then your request for the lift, um, I I think it needs to be done with the recordation of the tentative map as it's originally proposed in the conditions. Uh, the trigger is the condominium conversion. Um, and I realize the tenant improvements are going to come later, but I, I think as part of the approval of the um, tentative map that the, the lift needs to occur as outlined, originally envisioned in these conditions of approval. May, may I comment on that? Sure. Um, the, uh, I think the original outline of the conditions, as I mentioned earlier in talking to uh, Mr. Hansen, it was somewhat misleading that they the intent was not to have it physically installed but either have it physically installed or at the very least planned for and agreed to be installed at a future date through the deferment process so we're not looking to skirt the requirement we're not looking to avoid uh, the responsibility of designing and perhaps ultimately installing the lift uh, we do believe it is a vital component and, and it, a necessity uh, we're just looking from a timing standpoint to have the ability to continue moving forward with recording the map while the lift and, and the public improvements that are required for Paul Street guidelines and the uh, sidewalk and all the other uh, street improvements are considered and, and, and uh, put together at a later date. Uh, we still have to plan for it. We still have to submit building permit applications for it and construction drawings and everything else. So the obligation is still essentially 90% there, it's just a matter of not physically doing the work at this point in time. But part of the agreement would be to identify an acceptable time frame within which the work should be done. And, and that... But I don't have any of that right here. I don't have... I don't have... I know we bond for um, public improvements and that you know the city can go in and do, but we're now we're talking about bonding for private improvements on private property. Unfortunately, our our, our building and safety uh, person is absent today. So, is there a mechanism in which, uh, perhaps, at a later date uh, during the appeal process or sometime in the immediate future, 
we can clarify that and perhaps modify the condition after the fact. Is Chris not here today? Or he's, is not, he's, he's not here today. Yeah, he's actually not. He was planning on attending. Yeah, he, he coming here for questions. Yeah. But I looked for him. Who? He's not in today, and I don't know that anyone else is. Well. Well, why don't we? I can take like a, a ten minute recess, and you can go see if there's someone else in building and safety who can come in and help. With okay. That. We can do that. Okay. I'll take a ten minute recess until um, ten fifty. Thank you for extending that courtesy. Yeah. Incandescent wire, go for the female of the species. Turn on the AC and the DC. This I could use. Okay, I'm going to reconvene the meeting. We were talking about um, the lift and um, the applicant's desire about postponing it versus, um, you know, what kind of, how we would enforce it. Okay, thank you. Um, we did talk to uh, the building official, mm -hmm. and um, what we would suggest is that this could be deferred until after the, the construction of the lift could be deferred until after the final map is recorded. And one way to assure that it is done is to uh, add a condition under our recorded conditions mm -hmm. agreement, um, stating that, that prior to the issuance of any building permit on the property, that this would be required. And that would be our um, assurance that it's done. So when any, any permit comes in for any of the condominiums, that that would be a requirement, that that is instructed. And we can come up with the language to For either there. site or just proposed site one? No, any site. Um, I would say, yeah, any, either, any, both. <laughs> Mr. Anything Rudin. on those two? Yes. Danny Costas, um, senior planner. So we spoke to George Estrella, the, the building official, and basically the handicap access is a requirement for this building. So they, will, they would not issue any building permit until, uh, I mean, unless that handicap ramp was incorporated into that building permit they were issuing. Well, that's what I was asking. Is so what's the trigger for the, is it the condominium conversion? The fact is being converted? Because they're not doing any improvements other than street improvements. So right. There are, no build, there are no building permits that are, my understanding is there are no building permits triggered by this project. But when they sell off the individual condos, there will be tenant improvements. And those cannot be issued until the handicap ramp would be uh, installed or at least put into, you know, put into the building permit for that. And the reason we want to, I want to put it in recorded conditions is that puts the potential owners on record that that is going to be something that will have to be taken care of. And it's an internal matter to, to the tenants of that building, who pays for it and, and how that gets done. We don't, we don't actually care about that. We just want it mm -hmm. constructed before, you know, alongside any other improvements. So the condition would say something to the fact that prior to any building permit on either parcel for any project, Correct. the, pro the building may, must comply with ADA. That way, if Correct. A, whether it's a ramp or a lift, I know a lift, lift is proposed now. I don't know that a ramp would work. But One, one thing just to clarify, um, when, and speaking to Mr. Hansen, he wanted to make sure that whatever discussion we have that we don't mention ADA or, or those specific requirements because uh, he said something about the building department only being obligated to Title 24 okay. so that it should specifically identify the accessible entrance at Chapala or accessible access, that's redundant, um, accessible entrance at Chapala street frontage, that's what it was, the accessible entrance at the Chapala street frontage. Right and not tie it to uh, ADA compliance. And that proposal is, is definitely acceptable, and thank you for the accommodation. So it would be, it has to be accessible access or um, meet, comply Title 24? It, the way Chris phrased it when we were talking on the phone was that access, plan submitted for 
or provided that there is an accessible entrance off of Chapala. And the implication of using the term accessible implies handicap, wheelchair, etc. So they're not even. Um no, he didn't mention Title Twenty Four. No, he just said make sure there's an accessible entrance off of Chapala. So prior to any building permit on either parcel for any project, the building must provide accessible provide an accessible entrance off Chapala Street. I think that's clear. Yeah. Okay. Or you say compliance with California Code of Regulations, which is, I don't know that. Mr. Building Permit? That's me. Oh, yeah. Prior to any building permit on either parcel for any project, the building must comply? Mm -hmm. California Code of Regulations. That's that something. That includes 24? Yes. Okay. Thanks, George. Thank you. Last. Okay. So we add that. Do we then change this one or just delete? We could add that one and then change it to what the applicant is proposing. So, so A is recorded conditions, B is public works mill prior to final map or parcel map. Thank you. C Okay, C. E did that one E, okay. F that's all construction. Yeah, because D is public works permit or building permit, so those would be implemented with any public improvements. Same with C. No, yeah, I think it's okay to change it to. Because this is just recording the map, and then when you do the actual improvements, all the other ones are going to come into play. Mm -hmm. That was our understanding as to why mm -hmm. we proposed the, the wording the way we did. Well, prior to certificate of oxygen for the condominium conversion permit, which is. That's the yeah, answer so that. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, to change it to the. And perhaps so we get rid of this heading and you just so you get rid of this whole thing and just, just have it as written here. And, and perhaps uh, with this clarification, the heading of G uh, could be modified to read prior to certificate of occupancy for the building permit, which is exactly what mm -hmm. it says after. If you read the bold and then this, the first line after the bold, yeah, no, G is fine the way it is. Prior to the certificate of occupancy for the economy and conversion permit. Prior to the issuance of the certificate for the... For the building permit. Yeah, for which is for the economy and conversion. So that's presumed TI work? I mean, that's what we were talking about there? Well, yeah, the actual permit to convert this to okay. condominiums. Physically convert it? Yeah. Okay. Because right now we're just legally creating the space, so I just want to make sure there was a... We're good. Okay. All right, so make the findings outlined in the staff report with the revised conditions of approval. So we're adding the one regarding the um, complying with the California Code of Regulations under A and revising A5B, which is... Um, adding required parking and specifying it for one and two, lots one and two. The deletion 
or I guess, yeah, I could say deletion of B2. This is just underlining, this is an addition, this is, this was in the original one, right? This is the one it talks about Canterbury de Lavina, that's just specifying that's just which streets. Specifying streets, it's not a okay. change. So there's no changes until eight, uh, B8, and that's in regards to the um, specifying the number of parking spaces, adding in the reciprocal access agreement is shown on the tentative map, um, and off-site parking agreement. Adding B9 regarding the um, site mitigation. And changing um, condition H to just read, um, to take out the intro and just have it be parcel map re recordation period, and then the parcel map should not be recorded until such time as the conditions of sections A, B, and E are satisfied. Okay. So you approved your tentative map and condominium conversion permit. And as I said at the beginning of the hearing, I'm not, I don't know if you were here or not, the um, we're extending the appeal period to January 7th, um, recognizing that our offices are going to be closed for two weeks due to the furlough starting next Monday. And um, the appeal period would typically end during that appeal period or during that closure. So it would have been extended to the 4th anyways, just because that's the last day we're open. So it's just a couple days longer. And it gives anybody who may have an interest the time to be able to come in and discuss with staff or if you had some concerns to be able to discuss with staff. Um, okay. Before the close of the appeal period. So does that mean that the appeal period expires on the seventh, or end of day seventh goes through the seventh? Through the seventh, so okay. the end of the business day. Okay. Okay. And then the planning commission also has oversight authority of all my actions, and I have a liaison, and um, you know they review the applications, and if they feel this warrants additional discussion before the planning commission, they also have the authority to call us up before them. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much okay. for your time this thank morning. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank and you, I adjourn the meeting. <laughs>